Okay, well, um, it is six o'clock. I think we were expecting one or two other non-cabinet members to join us, but um, six, I think, oh, better make a, make a start and um, bring people in there. So um, welcome to this meeting of Cold Vale's cabinet. Um, obviously, um, <clears throat> this is this meeting's again taking place virtually, so it's um, being conducted over over Zoom and live streamed. Um, in in the meeting at the moment, we have all the, um, the six cabinet members: myself, Councillor Swift, the leader, Councillor Scully, and Deputy Leader, Councillor Metcalf, Adult Services, Councillor Patient, Cabinet Member for Climate Change and Environment. Councillor Press, Public Services and Communities, and Councillor Wilkinson, Children and Young People Services. Um, we have um, Ian, who is head of legal in the meeting, and a number of other officers, uh, and, and Nigel Broadbent Finance in the meeting, a number of other, other officers available to be called in as and when required. Um, and from other groups, we have Councillor Blackborough and Councillor Whitaker from the Conservative group, Councillor Baker from the Liberal Democrats. I think there are one or two others who, who may be joining as the meeting goes along. So item one is apologies for absence. Um, there are no apologies from, from any cabinet members. Item two is to remind members to declare any interest they may have in items on the agenda, either now or as they arrive. Nobody has notified me of any in advance. Item three deals with admission to the public. Um, there's one item on the agenda which will be taken with the press and public excluded. That means the, the live stream to YouTube will be turned off at that point. That's item 12. That's because it deals with finance and business affairs. The full reason is set out on the agenda paper. I'll just ask colleagues to agree that uh, the press and public excluded of that item. Can you see, please? Thank you. Item four is the minutes of the meeting of Cabinet, which was held on the 21st of May. These were uh, circulated separately. And um, can I ask colleagues whether there are any problems with those? Are we happy then to agree those as a true and correct record? Thank you. That's agreed. Item five is question time. Um, I'm aware of one question from a member of the public that's being submitted in advance. I wonder if I could ask um, Ian Hughes, head of legal, to read that out. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, this comes from Dr. Andy McGillicott. Uh, he says, as the UK enters a severe and prolonged recession, will the council downgrade its economic growth forecasts to a realistic level, thereby allowing fewer greenfield sites to be allocated for housing and or employment in the emerging local plan? Thank you. Um, Councillor Scullion, could I ask you to comment on that? Thank you, Leader. Um, and thank you to Mr. Um, McElligott for his question. Thank you. Um, I will provide Mr. McElligott with a full written answer, but I just wanted to say a few things uh, just here in the meeting. Um, and it's certainly true to say that the pandemic has given us all a great deal of food for thought in terms of what life will be like in the new normal on the other side of the pandemic. And there are certainly many of the Council's plans and policies um, that we will have to be, be re-examining. Um, but I just wanted to say something very immediate in terms of uh, the initial thoughts that are prompted um, in relation to his question. And I will indeed give him a full and, and detailed response in due course. The first thing to say, and this is news pretty much hot off the press, I think it was yesterday it came in, um, that we have heard from the planning inspector that the second part of the council's local plan examination is likely to go ahead this year, um, later this year, but it's not entirely clear what form that examination will take, whether it will be in person where people can attend the meeting, whether it will be virtual like this Zoom meeting we're having at the moment, or whether it will be some sort of hybrid form of, of the two that remains to be determined by the inspector. 
That examination, um, we understand, will interrogate the balance of economic growth and housing need. And I do expect the inspector to be expect the inspector to be very full and rigorous in her examination of exactly those questions that Mr. McGilligot um, uh, raises. I think ahead of my written answer, I want to also just offer a couple of initial observations. Although it's very early to be thinking about some of the, the issues, I actually think there's something in particular for Calderdale and the quality of life and the outdoor environment that we have in Calderdale. I think a number of people are thinking about the question of living in cities without access to, to green space and, and you know, canals and rivers and water um, and actually the quality of life that the people who are living near that kind of countryside actually have. So I do expect a borough like Calderdale to become more popular in many ways. I think we will see more housing demand of people wanting to come in to Calderdale. It's a very desirable place to live. And I think we've all discovered that during lockdown. I think the second thing to mention is that some of you will remember that in our draft plan, one of the things that we emphasized and put in, in the re revision of the plan was more mixed use spaces where people could live and work. And I think certainly that was very prescient um, in terms of what the future is going to look like for us, that more people will be working at home and more people will wish to have space to work at home and live above the shop as it were uh, in the future. So I think it raises a number of questions, things like broadband and our digital infrastructure, uh, but I will provide Mr. McGillicott with um, a more detailed written response. Thank you for your question. Thank you. So we will follow that up with a um, written response. So I, as far as I know, that was the only question submitted by a member of the public. And then I've had notice of a question from Councillor Baker. So Councillor Baker. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, this is a question that came, uh, was emailed through to me from uh, a Jim McNeil. Um, and he, he's asked me to ask uh, Cabinet this evening about the roadworks on Elland Road, Amy Top and Rastrick Bridge. And he wonders if residents of Elland and Brighouse could be given some likely idea of completion time and also what alternative rain arrangements are in place for the duration of the works. So I think again, uh, uh, Jane, Councillor Scullion, that's one for you. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'm afraid this is a, a bit of a long answer and I will follow it up in writing, but I just wanted to, to, to give the resident, Councillor Baker, um, and others actually who have raised, raised this issue, um, uh, some of the detail, because it is a difficult time and I really sympathise with residents, uh, but many of the problems that we're facing around these roads are actually related to flooding. And we didn't expect that flooding and we didn't expect the pandemic and there's, there's a perfect storm in some ways of things that we have to deal with at the moment. Let me just deal with the issues, particularly in in and around Brick House, um, which is, is a particular pinch point. You will know that Park and Ellen Road is close due to a landslip, and that was caused by the flooding. And we've been doing ground investigations. First of all, we had to check that the land was no longer moving. There was no longer a landslip. We had to wait for it to stabilize. We had to do investigations. And we're now starting on the remediation, and that's going to be sheet piles, um, to hold the hillside back, there's concrete float for the road, there's some really quite technical things uh, that's going to cost, um, certainly in the region of millions rather than, than less than that. And we expect that road not to open until early spring 2021. And I'm, I'm really sorry about that, but we have to make that road safe. And our investigations have shown that that will take until that period. The second, and this is also flooding related, is Rastrick Bridge. Um, the bridge is closed due to what the um, engineers call scour damage. And you might have seen that in sort of in bankings on rivers where, you know, sort of swoop, scooped out a sort of round circular hole where things have been scoured and it's eroded the banking. In this case, it's happened to, to the bridge. Um, 
And again, we've had to do full surveys. We've had to have divers, specialist divers, in inspecting the bridge. And indeed, as well as the scurrying, there is also um, a relatively small crack. The work is going to start on that site um, in mid-June, and it should be completed by mid-July, or even earlier if we're, we're very lucky. And indeed, if we continue to have this, this um, uh, weather and river levels remain low. Um, I've agreed that the work can, can start as soon as possible. I've asked the engineers to expedite this because I know how important that bridge is. Um, and indeed, people are experiencing traffic issues around um, Rastrick Bridge. We are looking at whether there should be some temporary parking restrictions or some temporary TROs in terms of um, working at the impact on residents and indeed um, on people wanting to use that. And then I come to the third part. I did promise, Leader, I'm sorry, this is a long answer, but I thought it was important because it does affect a lot of people in the borough. The third part of my answer is about the A629 resurfacing works. We have actually got a limited window for resurfacing works anyway. And at any other time, this would have been a perfect time to do these works. Um, and indeed, we got capital monies from the government to carry these particular repairs out. We have actually been recently reminded, indeed, we've got instructions and advice from Her Majesty's government to basically try and accelerate the delivery of any large highway schemes, which they consider to be essential to the recovery of the national economy. And clearly, this is a fairly arterial road linking us uh, with Huddersfield, the hospitals, the motorway, etc. And there are reduced traffic levels at the moment. It might have seemed like a perfect time. We weren't to know that the flooding would take out Park, Elland Road and Rastrick Bridge at the same time. It is really unfortunate and I'm sorry that it has caused, it caused some congestion. Um, in terms of the A629, we are dividing the work into four discrete sections and trying to make sure that each little section gets done as quickly as possible. Um, so May to, to, May to mid-June for the section that's being worked on at the moment. Um, et cetera, et cetera. I'll put the full details in my, my reply to you. Overall, the work is going to take 12 weeks. And normally with re the reduced traffic, that would have been absolutely fine. Um, but it is, it, is, it is really unfortunate. We hope that after we've done the first section, we'll be able to look again at the traffic patterns and, and work, work out how we might actually do that better. I must finish, Leader, by just mentioning we do have one other problem that we're working on. And that's uh, about the um, M62, the highways agency who do the signing on, on the M62 have warned people that the A629 is closed for works um, or is, is um, delaying uh, people journeys because of the works and advising people to seek a different junction. We think that that's also causing problems. People then go on to Brighouse and hit the, uh, the pinch points there and we're trying with the highways agency to get that changed uh, insofar as they can. I'll stop there but um, Councillor Baker, um, I'm sorry I can't give your resident more reassurance in relation to that. Um, but I will write this in a full response to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. I suspect that's a, an answer that might be of, um, of, of wider interest to a number of councillors on the uh, on this call and beyond as well. This does have quite a wide, wide impact, but thank you for that uh, detailed explanation. Um, Councillor Whitaker, did you want to ask a question on under general questions? I've got you down for an item later on, but I'm just seeing you in the chat. So uh, we do have some spare time if you want to come in. Sorry, Chair, I wasn't sure whether to ask my question under this item or the, or the next one, so it's... Uh... Yeah, if, if, if it's more suitable under the next one, under the COVID uh, item, I'm up to, to wait for that. Okay, that's, yeah, that's 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 fine. That was just the indication I had from, um, from Councillor Lee, so that's fine. Okay, um, so um, that covers the question time. Um, so we'll go on to the COVID item, um, which is agenda item six, and this is the update on um, well, on the council's ten-point plan and the actions that's been been taken. Um, so, 
as as members and colleagues will appreciate, we've had to deal with some extraordinary changes and challenges over the last last two months, um, both in terms of the potential health and public health threats, but also the um, you know the impact of that in terms of what it's required on the council, on our partners. Um, you know, really has been unprecedented in terms of, of the complexity and the effect on, on every individual. Um, as people will know, put this into context, the um, dealing with the, the, the virus, of course, most of all, is about avoiding a, a major public health, dealing with a major public health threat. Um, we've seen under the um, pillar one of the testing, which anyone have the figures for, 291 um, cases, um, in, identified and tested positive in Calderdale, 173 Calderdale residents admitted to hospital and, and very tragically 100 deaths, uh, every, every one of which is an individual tragedy, of course. Um, but also to bear in mind that many of the people who required critical care in hospital may be discharged, but we don't really yet understand fully um, what the long-term health implications can be for some people, but we know if people have been in intensive care, in, in any case, that leads to substantial recovery periods, but also there are some signs that people have serious cases that COVID can have continuing complications as well. Um, above and beyond the health impact, re responding to firstly the social distancing requirements and then the lockdown that's required both the council and our partners to change how we operate in, in all sorts of ways and at considerable pace. Um, we set out how we thought we needed to structure our, our response at a meeting in, in mid-March where we set out our 10-point plan and this report highlights progress against that and progress that's been made and, and the actions we continue to need to take. Um, I won't go through all of the 10 points in uh, considerable detail. I see people's looks of relief about that. Um, but it's a sign of how quickly it's changed. If you look at the detailed action plan, which uh, was signed off of this report perhaps some eight or nine days ago, quite a number of things there have, um, you know, have already moved on because a lot of the focus has been on health, the work we do directly as um, for our responsibilities with public health, the work we do jointly with partners in the NHS and supporting them um, with, their, with their challenges, the major changes we've made around social care, the opening of CD courts and other facilities, um, the detailed support we've given to care homes and so on. Um, the work then that's been required with the, the people who are very vulnerable, the setting up of the volunteer hubs, supporting and coordinating community responses, um, channeling support towards businesses and handing out literally processing and, and dealing with literally thousands of, uh, of, of grants to businesses under the grant scheme that was set up, supporting our workforce in very very changed circumstances you know, in a short period of time we've moved to a position where um, 1300 of our staff are um, are now working working remotely which has been an extraordinary change um, and many other changes all of that has come at a considerable cost both in terms of staff time and energies um, and I do want to pay tribute to our staff and to the staff in many of our partners and in the voluntary agencies and our volunteers who have put in so much time in supporting Calderdale's response to date. The report also starts to look at the next stage of recovery and change as the, the rules around lockdown change and we start to look at the impact on, on businesses and wider society and the changes that are needed. An appendix to the report includes a, an, an early version of the resilient West Yorkshire Resilience Forum's recovery strategy, reset and rebuild strategy, which sets out some of the some of the actions that need to be taken to the broad headings of things like safe transport, safe communities, safe workspaces, safe public spaces and safe education. Again, there's a a lot of detail in the report, which I won't, won't repeat here. I think it's important people recognise that even if the lockdown is 
being eased and some of the regulations are changing. And fortunately, at the moment, the number of cases, the number of deaths falling, we are a very long way away from returning to anything like normal as it was beforehand. And we're likely as a, a community to need to be operating in a very different way for very many months and potentially some, some years to come. I think I'll, I'll pause at that point and um, take any, any quest, questions and comments. If I can, first of all, ask if any cabinet colleagues want to add anything or comment on any points in the report at this stage. I've got Councillor Metcalf, and then I'm aware of that Councillor Whitaker wants to ask a question or comment. Uh, yeah, Bob, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to pick up um, the uh, is it? I'd just like to pick up the uh, issue regarding um, care homes. It's contained partly in object of, of the objection one. I did mention the important work that's going on, the huge amount of work that's taking place in supporting care homes and our care home providers in Calderdale. Um, a number of these crucial elements uh, are listed under healthcare, public health in this section, uh, particularly things like contacting care homes daily to assess needs. And that's crucially uh, getting daily information on the situation in care homes um, and also with a weekly community update. Um, the other issues that's listed there, and these are not ex exhaustive, the um, the multi-agency COVID response team to focus on care homes with significant risk factors and particularly on infection control, uh, providing additional support where care providers have identified particular staffing issues or have a high number of residents who are COVID-19 positive and absolutely crucial to ensure sufficient resources in place to support wider health and social system and redeploying our council staff to support this. I just think the amount of work that's gone on in this crucial area over the last month or so has just been uh, amazing. And it's really all our the dedication to all our staff throughout Calderdale, um, particularly in adult social care and, and other areas for the work they've now carried out in this crucial area of working hand in hand, working together with care homes and with our care home providers as well. I think it's been re really important that, and it's been, I think, really acknowledged how, how well received that work has been. Thank you, Bob. I don't have any other cabinet members at the moment. Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Scully. Chair, I just wanted to pick up on that in some ways, and um, certainly thank you and a credit to um, our care homes and our partners in both NHS and, and in care. And it's really a very difficult time. You read out the numbers earlier, Leader, but every time I hear the numbers, I want to basically remind people that these are people, these are human beings, um, uh, the people who have died, who were fathers and mothers and brothers and, and, and indeed children. Um, I wanted to pay um, tribute to some of those who don't necessarily get the credit. I think there's a particular credit to those who've kept us fed. People have not gone hungry in Calderdale and that's because we worked extremely hard. We worked extremely hard on the volunteer and community effort. And, and I know that councillors across, across the political divide have actually helped on that. Uh, but those who've been particularly involved in volunteer and community effort, but also things like, um, our shopkeepers and our market traders and our market staff and those who volunteered uh, to be redeployed into helping in terms of markets. And I think that importance of fresh food and keeping the food supply chain is a real credit to us. I also want to pay credit, pay tribute to the, to the bureaucrats. This is local government. And one of the things we do is to, to keep order and bureaucracy. The sheer number of bits of guidance that can come through at any one time. The example that's often given is the 41 
changes to the advice um, uh, to head teachers. But I have painstakingly sat and looked through each of those bits of guidance every day. There is the most enormous amount of stuff coming and I'm not necessarily reading what's coming to the health service. And we and our staff have to find a way of translating that and making it work in the cold deal context, whether it's financial, uh, whether it's to do with social distancing, transport, etc. So I actually pay tribute to people in their home offices trying to make sense of these things. And I think we have actually managed in Calderdale, you know, to keep the ship, ship afloat very well. Thank you, Jane. Um, okay, I'll go now to Councillor Whitaker. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I'm having issues with my video this evening, but as long as you can hear me okay, I think that's all that matters. Um, yeah, right, okay. Me. Yeah, fabulous. Um, so I've asked recently, um, first of all, in the old members uh, briefing a couple of weeks ago, and recently I sent an email to yourself, Councillor Swift, and uh, and, and uh, Robin as, as Chief Exec only yesterday, so I appreciate you won't have had a chance to fully look into these specific uh, questions and uh, detailed uh, detailed questions I do ask about this. Um, but I did ask about the, the decision to write to local schools, advising them against reopening to a larger cohort of students from today, uh, which is contrary to government advice and guidance. Um, as I say, I emailed you yesterday with, with some more specific details, which I won't, I won't go into because it will take far too, too long. Uh, but I did want to ask more generally uh, whether Cabinet would publish the data that has been used by the Council's advisors uh, that would seem to contradict the government data and has influenced the Cabinet to advise against the reopening of schools in the, in the borough as per the government guidance. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think, um, so I suppose the first thing I'd say is, is that the, um, the reasons for the advice we've given to schools, I think were, were fairly clearly set out in the letter that's gone to schools, which I think was shared with all members at the end of last week, and, and which we're quite happy to make, make public, but I think it's been pretty widely, um, pretty widely shared. And that is largely to do with um, our Director of Public Health's assessment of um, where we think we are against the, the government's five tests. Um, and in a sense, it's not so much the data, it's the, it's the absence of data, and particularly the data around testing now, I think, that is, that is a core concern. So um, without going too far into the technicalities, I, I mentioned on um, talking about the numbers that the, the number of confirmed cases in in Calderdale is, is based on what is referred to as pillar one, which is tests that are carried out directly by the NHS. Because the largest number of tests have been carried out under pillar two, which is the, um, the, the private sector commissioned testing. But we don't have any information on the number of tests of Calderdale residents there and the results of them. And that's the, the big area of uncertainty about what the, the actual level of infections is firstly. But then also it leaves the uncertainty about if lifting lockdown leads to an increase of cases, how quickly would we know that and how quickly would be, we, we be able to respond to it? And I think in a nutshell, that is the core element. But we will, we will share more widely the letter. And I think actually, Count, um, Councillor Richard, I think, I think Chief Exec has replied to your letter with, with some of that information as, as well. Um, I think it's worth noting in this, I mean, this isn't a case about blindly going against government advice for the sake of it. And I think we do need to draw a clear distinction between um, the scientific advice, which is very cautious and qualified, and the decisions that the government's chosen to take on that. Of course, they're entitled to take a judgment on that. Um, but I think also, you know, like every council, we um, you know, we employ professional officers to advise them, and particularly we employ a director of public health, and equally we have to and should listen carefully to the advice that they're given. I suppose the other things that's worth highlighting in this context, perhaps two other things, one is that nationally the Association of Directors of Public Health came out over the weekend and said that they were concerned about the pace of the um, relaxation of the lockdown, again for very similar reasons. Um, and similarly, there's, as I think people will be aware, there's been a number of members of the, of the government scientific advisory committee of SAGE also 
voicing their concerns about it. So this is not at all a straight, a straightforward or clear cut decision. We understand that, but in the light of the advice we've had, that we we felt that was the right thing to do. Um, I think just moving to the positives about that, I think it's important to emphasise firstly that, of course, you know most of our schools are open. They've been providing support to key workers, and that is the number one priority under the government advice. Um, and of course, many of them are continuing to look at what they would need to do to take in um, a larger number of the children at, at the point when we all agree that that's the appropriate thing to do. And of course, we'll be looking carefully over the next couple of days, I think, both at um, you know, what the experience in other areas is, but also you know, we, we, we're being told that as a result of the test, trace and isolate system, we should start to get more local data. And hopefully that will get to a position where we can have more confidence about the advice in the next in the next stages. I don't know if there are any um, any further points. Anybody? Yeah, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Leader. I think you've you've covered most of the things that I, I was going to say, really. But I think you've nailed it, really, with with pointing out that the issue is not so much what data have we used, but the the, the absence of of data in a lot of cases really so we don't have that pillar two data that the leaders referred to which actually makes up probably the majority of the testing that's actually happened in Calderdale so I don't think anybody can really definitively say that we de definitely have a low infection rate we also we, we don't have a regional figure on what the R rate is anymore either the government stopped providing that so we didn't have the figure for Calderdale but until relatively recently we at least had a figure for the region and when that was last published we were actually the worst affected region in the country which is obviously a cause for concern. Um, we do know that the chief scientific officer has said that R is likely to be very close to one in some areas and we also know that SAGE has said that any scenario where children would go back to school um, would lead to an increase in R. So obviously if there's some areas that are very close to one and we know that any return of pupils is gonna push that R rate up, then that's obviously very concerning. Um, and again, coming back to the lack of data, the, the SAGE paper that was published didn't include the scenario that the government's actually gone with so we don't have a an actual opinion from sage on what the the impact of that that scenario that is 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 being implemented would be and then yeah just finally as the leaders pointed out that you know that there is a mix of opinion on this you know with the association of public health has come out saying it june the first is too early we've had four members of sage this weekend express concerns about the lockdown being eased too early. The Royal College of Nursing, the Independent Sage Group, the British Medical Association. So it's not just a case of, um, you know, some militant left-wing unions that are coming out and, and opposing the government for, for the sake of it on this. There is a real mix of opinion. There's no black and white uh, scientific consensus. So we've just had to really be cautious on this and just do what we think is right for us here in Calderdale. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, it always always causes a wry laugh in the Labour group whenever anybody accuses me of being a militant left winger, but there you go. Um, I think you just want to move on to, to sort of, you know, a couple of the kind of positives and priorities going forward, really. I, I mean, um, didn't touch on it within the 10 point plan, but it just came up with a couple of those answers that, um, you know, one of the big announcements last week was around the test tracing and isolating and do very much welcome that governments recognise that local government has an absolutely critical role to play in this and that will be developing over the next month with the development of a local outbreak plan as, as part of that. And I do very much hope as part of that that does mean we get um, the detailed data we need about what's happening within cold I think that will give a great deal more confidence for all of the steps forward we want to take. Um, I think it's probably also worth saying, you know, with with the um, I think with the 
various announcements about different changing measures and things. You know, I do, I do think people are probably getting a little confused about what the kind of core advice is, and it probably is just worth saying that it seems to us there's probably three or four absolutely key things for people. The first one is right back to the basics from before the lockdown, which is that hand washing and good respiratory hygiene are absolutely fundamental still to preventing the spread of the disease. Um, and to protecting both ourselves and others. The second is that social distancing is still really important and still the best way, particularly inside or in con confined spaces of reducing transmission. And then the two key things is we really, really need people to take on board the core principles about the test and trace and isolate. But this will only work if as soon as people have, feel they have symptoms that they self-isolate and apply to get a test. And if you're contacted by the contact tracers, however hard it is and told you've been in close contact, that you must follow the advice and, and again, and must self-isolate. Um, and those are the things that will actually make the difference to keeping the incidence of the virus low in the community and enable other activities to go on and go ahead. So. Um, I hope you forgive me for adding those at the end, but I do feel that those are, you know, the really critical messages that we all need to try and get across to people. So thank you for those. I think that covers most items on that item. Um, the recommendation is to approve the process and, and recognise the importance of the continuing work around these 10 priorities. Can I just check with cabinet colleagues? We're happy to agree that we are. So thank you very much. I'll move us on then to item seven, which is um, implementation of recommendations from the youth service scrutiny and um, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, leader. Um, so yeah, there's, there's three things really that have driven the proposal set out in this report, which I'll, 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 I'll go through if, if that's okay. Um, so, Firstly, as part of the robust budget challenge process that's been ongoing since May last year, the youth service was identified as an area that would make up part, in, part of the savings target for the CYP directorate. And this was mentioned in the revenue monitor that went to Cabinet and was agreed in January of this year. Um, but I think more importantly, really, um, was the scrutiny review of youth services, which members of all party and, and non were involved in um, last year and cabinet received that paper and accepted its recommendations in December. Um, the only recommendation we didn't actually accept was the one that we would have another independent review because I think we felt that the piece of the scrutiny report was, was strong enough and that really we needed to to crack on with making making the uh, the reforms the, uh, the the changes, um, but the review was was probably one of the best pieces of scrutiny that I've actually seen in the eight years that I've been on the council. Um, it concluded that the service needed a new vision that was there was variability in standards of practice and delivery, and it basically recognised that it was a bit of an old fashioned service really that just doesn't really adequately meet the major challenges of the modern world for young people. And I think it, it, you know, it kind of realized that we needed to be targeting our youth services on issues like crime, antisocial behavior, mental health, um, CSE, human trafficking, extremism, et cetera, and keeping young people out of care, really doing work with, with young people who are on the edge of care. The review said there should be closer partnerships with the community and voluntary sector and recommended that third sector play a greater role in delivering open access services through a commissioned approach, whilst council run services should focus primarily on meeting the needs of young people most in need. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of grants and funding pots and stuff available in the third sector uh, to the third sector, which the council can't access. So, um, the, you know, the idea behind the paper is that we can help them tap into that, that those pots of funding that we can't access as a council. The, the report also said that having too many buildings is a drain on resources, but that we needed to make the most of the orange box and the investment that had gone into it. 
and it suggested that there should be a particular focus on, focus on areas of deprivation in order to tackle inequalities. And obviously that's also in line with our own aspirations as a, as a cabinet. So what the, the report before us does is to basically take all those proposals, um, take all the scrutiny recommendations on board and make proposals that are in line with those recommendations whilst also delivering the budget savings required. Now, obviously, since the scrutiny report, we've had COVID-19, which has also had a, a major impact on shaping what the report that we've got before us. Um, you know, we've had to close our open access sessions due to social distancing requirements. And obviously, we think this situation will continue for some time, as we've just been discussing. Um, so the proposal is that um, some of our youth workers will be moved into providing the more targeted work with our most vulnerable young people and some will remain in their current positions but will focus on virtual sessions and a small number will, will be made redundant in order to contribute towards the savings. Um, as mentioned in the paper, we have requested hundreds of laptops and tablets from government so that most vulnerable young people can access these virtual sessions. And just finally, I think to mention that the financial situation that the council now finds itself in because of COVID-19 also means there's a real sense of urgency really in delivering the savings that have been previously agreed. So I think the big thing here really is to recognise that the role of youth work has changed nationally over the last 10 years and Calderdale hasn't really quite moved with the times up to now. And I think you know, we've, we've, we're facing the, the challenge of the financial situation and the challenges of COVID-19, but I think really this is an opportunity to, to shape the, the service so that it better meets the needs of young people in the 21st century. Um, so I'll leave it there, Leader, and uh, move the recommendations as set out in the paper to allow our Director of Children's Services to commence the restructure and the consultation. Uh, okay. Thank, thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, I'm aware Councillor Evans was hoping to join the meeting, but hasn't been able to, but I think Councillor Baker has his questions. So I'll just check, first of all, Councillor Baker, whether any other Cabinet members want to comment initially, and then I'll come to you. Okay, Councillor Scullion. I would endorse what Councillor Wilkinson said about the scrutiny review. It was sharp, it was hard hitting, and it was actually quite short as scrutiny reviews go. Um, and it did get to the point, and for me, one of the most telling things that it said was about targeting the children most in need, targeting those areas of antisocial behaviour, possible child sexual exploitation and so on, getting the most vulnerable and those who need it most. And actually, I think it has historically, it's an old fashioned view of, you know, you, th you, you sit in a youth centre as a youth worker and you wait for children motivated to come to you that old-fashioned view has got to change really and this I understand this this paper is about beginning the consultation with staff and asking for permission for that um, I think generally it's really really focused our minds on what is a youth service for in a modern modern time thank you thanks Councillor Scullion uh, for no other cabinet members at this point. Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you, Chair, for allowing this to, to do. He's just emailed it, it across to me and, and I'll just read it out now. Uh, I'll try and be as brief as possible. It's a little bit lengthy, perhaps. Um, he says uh, the CYP scrutiny review said that there was a need for a new strategy and approach, one based on the needs of young people in Calderdale, focused on areas of high deprivation indices of multiple uh, deprivation. However, he says his concern in relation to this report is that it seems to centre around cost savings and focusing largely on statutory services rather than necessarily developing and improving services. He says, in fact, item two of the report, which is the need for decisions about seeking cabinet permission to consult on 6.9 FTE redundancies. He says he fully understands the financial pressures under which the council is labouring, but is there a danger that cutting in this area could lead to more and more expensive problems in other areas, not least young people's uh, mental health? Um, he says, whilst youth services have for a long time been well supported by the voluntary sector, it would appear that this proposal relies much more heavily on these organisations. It's common knowledge that many of these organisations are struggling at the moment, particularly during the COVID 
pandemic and this strikes him as a, a dangerous move in relation to the long-term delivery of the service. He says, understanding the time of the pandemic, a significant amount of emphasis is also placed on the need to replace open access work by evolving virtual systems, wherever he'd hoped that this does not preclude open access in the longer term. He says the report seeks to measure outcomes through KPIs, but as often the case, these seem to be a little bit vague and uh, therefore making it difficult to make assessments of the success or failure of the, the reforms if they're introduced. He says his reactions and misgivings may well be uh, misplaced, but if they are, then he would like to seek some clear statements from Cabinet and the Directorate that the level and quality of the service will not decline, but will in fact improve. And he makes one final comment, which is, it's a little bit disappointing to note that no reference to job cuts is evident in the recent press release. And he is concerned that the Cabinet is in danger of panned into central government cuts and the, the pressure that we have to make those cuts, irrespective to their effect on the service and the young people of Calderdale. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I might comment briefly on, on, on one of those, but then, uh, well, a couple, couple of points and then, then bring Adam back in. Um, I, think, I think as Adam, Adam sort of tried to explain in terms of the open access, obviously the, the, the focus of the report has shifted a bit because of COVID, but actually in some, to some extent in terms of developing future kind of open access and voluntary sector, I mean, that's both an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is it gives a bit more time to, to actually think and shape it. So I think it's going to always be seen as a two-stage process. This is about restructuring the core team and, yes, delivering the savings. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but it gives a bit more time, perhaps, to think about what the future shape looks like. But I do recognise the point about, generally, the voluntary sector, like everything else, is going to be under pressure post the, the impact of, um, of COVID. Um, I certainly don't think, I mean, we may not put it into every press release we make, but, um, but in terms of being very clear about the impact of, of, uh, of funding pressures on the council, we will continue to make that point, and I hope we'll have as far as possible cross-party support in pressing government for um, not just covering the costs of COVID, but covering the impact in terms of lost income and the long-term effects that that may have, and I'm sure that's something we'll, we'll be returning to repeatedly, I think, over the the next few weeks. Um, right, so just bring Adam back in on a couple of the other points. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, I mean, I was I was quite upfront about the fact that obviously the need to make savings was a key consideration in, in this, but obviously, as I've also set out, the scrutiny recommendations, we've, we've accepted all of those recommendations. And I think we've, we've responded to each of them quite clearly in the report. Um, and, and, you know, really seeing this as a, an opportunity to reshape the service so that it actually meets the needs of young people in the 21st century. It's not just a simple job cutting and savings exercise. I do take the point about the third sector um, being impacted by COVID-19, but I think, you know, often they're be better placed to meet the needs of young people, and as I said, to access funding in a way that the council can't, can't do. So the idea is that they will offer the open access sessions in the future in those areas of deprivation. And we will work with ward members as well to, um, to discuss how we can best do that and best meet the needs of, of uh, young people in, in your ward. Um, and then just finally picking up on the point about the KPIs. I mean, again, that was in response to the, the scrutiny paper. It clearly said that we should be producing an annual report so that there's some accountability so that we can actually check is the service doing what we're actually wanting of it because at the moment um, I don't think there's any real clear vision or objectives and nobody's checking on an annual basis to see whether we're actually doing what what we wanted it to do so I think it's just an attempt for people to be members to be able to check you know are we actually doing what we what we want it to do really. Perhaps just, just a couple of other points I'd add. One is um, just for clarification on the recommendation, I apologise, I should have picked this up before, um, but just on 3.1 where it says delegate authority to the director, I just wonder if we could say add, add there, probably implicit anyway, in consultation with the lead member for children's children and young people's services. I think we'd normally say that. Um, and um, I think the point about young people with mental health problems, obviously it's, you know, very well made and well recognised. Again, it's perhaps not 
fully pulled out in the in the detail of the report but um one of the changes in here is actually to put an extra an extra post into the um the young carers service which of course is working with a group who are under particular pressure in terms of mental health um although it's not part of this because we, we've also recently had the announcement about funding for an additional additional mental health teams to support schools which i, I again i think is very welcome and, and again this is probably an area where we're going to see some continuing impacts from COVID on young people as well. Um, so I think that probably covers most of the points that were raised. Can I just check if there are any other points or comments? In that case, can I see those in favour of the recommendations for that minor change we just made? Thank you very much. Um, item eight, parking strategy. Um, Councillor Press, can I ask you to introduce this? I'm muting myself I was expecting somebody else to do that um, yeah can I say first of all before going into um, the thinking and reasoning behind this report um, that this is of course the review of parking charges is something that happens every two years um, it's something that we we first um, decided um, to do on a regular basis um, in 2016 um, and the last one was indeed in 2018, so we're now in 2020, and, and so that's the context um, in which this report is coming before cabinets tonight. Um, obviously, um, charging for parking is, is not something that's ever popular, um, particularly with motorists, um, but we have to recognise that it's a key element in a wider strategy for managing our transport and our travel in a way that needs to be increasingly sustainable, environmentally uh, friendly, um, economically viable um, and fit for a society as it is in the 21st century, uh, not as it was 50 years ago. Um, and, and, and I say that because, because, because that's really going, that really um, is um, indicative of what I'm going to be saying next. Um, we have a responsibility as a council to ensure that the increasing number of vehicles on our roads can be managed safely so that traffic can flow freely and also that shoppers, visitors and workers can easily find spaces to park. Um, if you look, we've got some figures from the Office of National Statistics. There's a 29% increase in road traffic um, between 1990 and 2018. In the context of COVID-19, um, that figure can only go up um, as people at the moment um, are, are being told to, um, to avoid um, traveling by public transport. We'll be doing our best to redress that in some way, but we are in a very difficult situation at the moment where we're likely to see a significant increase in road traffic above and beyond what we would have expected in normal circumstances. It's also our task as a council to support wider objectives around encouraging the use of other forms of transport that are better for individuals' health. And you'll have seen in the, in the press uh, last week um, that we are, uh, we are taking steps to encourage people to, to go to cycle to work, to make it easier for pedestrians, um, and to benefit the environment generally um, in, in, in terms of the statistics that we've got on greenhouse gas emissions, um, though, those made at road, those from road transport actually make up around a fifth of the total emissions. It's also wildly acknowledged that road transport creates harmful air pollutants. We're all, we're all aware of that. Um, pollutants such as nitrogen oxides and small particulate matter which is responsible for, for, many, uh, for many deaths and respiratory illnesses. The most recent figures from Public Health England suggest the death rate in the under 75s from respiratory conditions is significantly higher in Calderdale than the national average. And there are 120 premature deaths per year in the borough calculated as directly attributable to poor air quality. So it's within all that context and, and the important one of working towards a better environment that we're looking at um, the, way, um, we, um, the way we run our parking services, 
um, and what we do to make uh, parking in Calderdale as sustainable as it possibly can be. It's not about being anti-car, um, but we have to be serious and we have to be seen to be serious about improving air quality, helping people to live longer and healthier lives and tackling climate change as we promised to do uh, in our declaration of a climate emergency in 2019. Um, so um, the upshot of all these considerations is that we need to manage vehicles and their use much better than we have done in the past with much more traffic to actually have to cope with. Everybody knows there are physical and mental health benefits to cycling and walking, as well as improvements to air quality and the wider environment. This is reflected in government policy with the recent announcement of a two billion pound fund to support alternative ways to travel. And the council is pursuing a number of specific initiatives for safe, safe transport and safe spaces in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. There's no doubt that people want more choice over how they travel, whether it's to do the family shop, to walk their children to school, uh, cycle for the daily commute, or simply for pleasure. pleasure. Everybody needs to be able to choose the option which suits them best uh, and know that it is safe, cost-effective, convenient, and reliable. That's why we're working hard to provide viable alternatives for people to consider as part of a sensible, sustainable transport policy and to capitalise on some of the behaviour changes that the coronavirus crisis has already brought about. The strategic parking policy referred to in the report is therefore an intrinsic part of this more holistic and considered approach to managing travel and transport. However, it's not just about health and the environment, it's also about sustaining the economy of our local towns as appropriate parking measures ensure turnover of space for shoppers and visitors and also generate important revenue to deliver investment in the wider highway and transport infrastructure. While the current COVID-19 crisis has had a profound effect, there is a need in the long term to future-proof town centres to ensure that sufficient space is available to support commercial activity that we know will happen as soon as businesses bounce back with the resilience for which Calderdale is well known. Um, it's worth pointing out that these changes, um, the timescale we've got for these changes, we would not anticipate them actually taking place before September. So I think that is also important to note. In conclusion, um, this report therefore, um, hopefully provides the necessary context to allow cabinet to consider a small number of changes. And these are, um, these are changes by the way, um, that have previously, um, one of them was implemented, was, was supposed to be implemented um, in, in 2006, another in 2014. These are things that have been discussed for years, um, extending the, um, the uh, parking charges later in the evening by two hours and the Sundays and bank holidays. These are things that have not only been on the table for many years, there are also things which are taken as read um, in, in most other towns and cities uh, in the UK. So, so we, we do regard these changes as necessary um, to make um, transport more sustainable. I'm asking Cabinet, therefore, to agree um, the recommendations before them tonight in the report, um, obviously with the caveat of carrying out the necessary consultation um, with a view to implementing these changes by September. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. And uh, if there are any questions. Thank you, Susan. I've got yeah, just, to be, just to be clear, sorry, just to be clear, that's that is to a extend existing charging hours in Halifax. You've just muted yourself, Susan, or somebody has. <laughs> Sorry, um, just, just to clarify those recommendations, A, B and C. A, extend existing charging hours in Halifax, Sefton Bridge and Sorby Bridge in West Vale. B, introduce Sunday charges in Halifax Town Centre. And C, introduce bank holiday charges in Halifax and Hebden Bridge. Sorry. 
Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So I've got Council Patient from Cabinet and then Councillor Lee and Councillor Baker both, both asked to comment on this item. So I'll go to Council Patient first. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'll be brief because um, I think Councillor Press has probably covered most of the pressing points there. But I think the difference this time round is the um, is 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 where we are. Um, we're we're operating um, under the um, umbrella of the climate emergency that we that we declared last year, and with that comes a lot of considerations. Um, also, currently, what we're going through, um, and some of the positive takeaways that 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 you know people have found within this crisis, specifically um, around air quality, and and thinking about do we want to swap you know one one disaster for one that was already there and and we actually need to pull our weight with regards to that as well um we are really behind in terms of where other people are and thinking about a parking strategy uh, that was reflected um with with our peer review last year where actually um some of the people that were speaking to us specifically um a councillor from waltham forest um really doubled down on what we knew which is um rethinking parking strategies does not have to mean um, any negative effects for the borough. In fact, places like Waltham Forest um, and Skipton um, are, are still thriving and thrive in different ways because of um, the changes that they've made. Um, we have opportunities as well. I know public transport is going to be difficult at the moment um, with the national guidelines, but we do have some opportunities with the devolution deal that we've just signed in terms of how we think about public transport at a wider West Yorkshire, West Yorkshire level. We've also got um, the nationalisation of, of, of Northern as well um, and what opportunities that might bring um, longer term after we um, come out of the COVID crisis. Um, so I think um, what, we, what we need to be mindful of is that when people use their cars, most journeys are within one or two miles. And what we're thinking about in terms of um, our COVID strategy and our active travel strategy will be making those journeys um, easier for people who want to walk there, who want to get on their bike, um, who want to use e-bikes which are popping up here, there and everywhere at the moment which are brilliant for getting um, people with less mobility back on bikes. Um, I know Councillor Scullion's really been enjoying her new e-bike and um, been tootling around on it. Um, so I don't think this needs to be a negative. The changes aren't happening yet um, they're not happening until September. What they will mean for most places are the difference of, you know, 40, 50p for an, for an evening trip. Um, and unfortunately, it won't be popular with everyone, but I do believe it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Um, OK, at this point, I'll go to non-cabinet members for questions. and uh, People come back. So, Councillor Lee. Hello. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, um, I don't disagree with the recommendation is that the cabinets uh, uh, recommend the necessary consultation here. But I think um, the, the second part of it rather assumes the results of the consultation or consultations. Um, but I do agree with the consultations. Um, this is unfortunate timing to think about putting the charges up. I accept many of the arguments that, the, that uh, Scott Patient and uh, Councillor Press have, have, have expressed, but the high street uh, town centres are in very, diffi very, very difficult circumstances right now. And some might argue on this point that uh, this is, this is not what we want to do, is put the cost of parking up when businesses are really struggling. And I say this, but it's not just an opinion. I think uh, a number of the cabinet uh, members are aware that last year at Place Scrutiny, we talked about this on more than one occasion and had a full room on one of these meetings because putting up pa parking charges at any time evokes very strong emotions, as uh, Councillor Patient has just said. Um, so it, it doesn't suit everyone, but businesses need all the help that we can give them at the present time. So all, all I would ask 
that in when you accept the recommendation to agree the necessary consultation, to let that consultation determine when the parking tariffs will, will be introduced, whether it's September or not, let that be decided through consultation and um, make that consultation as wide ranging and as robust as we can. And certainly invite businesses, particularly from Halifax and Hebden Bridge, obviously, to have the say on this. Um, there are always two sides to an argument. And I think that the timing right now is very unfortunate. Thank you, Leader. Um, thank you, thank you, Councillor Lee. I think, and there's a couple of council members want to come back. I think I'll bring Councillor Baker in as well, and then I'll go back to Councillor Wilkinson and Councillor Scully, if it's okay. Councillor Baker. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, I, I share some of Councillor Lee's concerns around the timing of this. I mean, we know how hard, hardly hit the hospitality trade has been by this pandemic and se around September, you know, hopefully those businesses will be opening back up. Um, and it's tr quite a different change and just put, you know, increasing charges by perhaps 10, 20 P, which might be the better way of doing the two year reviews. And then you could make small charges, which wouldn't have that much of a, a noticeable uh, effect and keep keep charges in line with inflation. Because I know in the past we had the problem where we didn't review charges for years and years. And then suddenly you had a big hike that did actually then have more of an impact on behavior change so my concern is when you're introducing it's not just a price rise it's introducing of introduction of new charges at new times and those times will be particularly when people are going out for uh, an, an evening meal um so uh, you know my concern is really the impact it will have on on restaurants in uh, the places where charges will apply um i do notice in the consultation that charges aren't going to be introduced everywhere in the evening in colderdale and it's selective those towns which are doing it so I wondered what the reasoning was for not introducing it in some places and, and if that is because you don't want to hurt those economies then surely you're, you're accepting that there is some economic impact to those those places where you are doing it. are you just saying that Hebden Bridge and Westvale and Salisbury Bridge can afford it whereas in Ellen they, they can't afford it so there's the question of fairness as well uh, across the borough and the economic impact um, it is something people feel very strongly about. You know, Council Press is, is right that we have looked at even charges in the past, but it was actually one of the issues under which we um, voted against the confidence of, of Tim Swift and it in, resulted in a change of the administration of the council. So I wouldn't underestimate how strong public feeling can get around car parking charges. I sometimes joke that if you're running a council, you need to keep the bins emptied and keep car parking charges low and council tax low and you'll stay in administration. So you don't, don't underestimate how upset people are by these, these things. In fact, you know, just from Thursday, I launched an online petition about it. We've already got up to 520 signatures of people who are opposed to these charges. I think the point about green economy, you know, we, we all want to see a transformation in how people travel. I'm not, I'm not sure that just introducing higher parking charges actually really uh, drives that change to, to greener cars in and of itself. And I'd perhaps like to see a bit more of a carrot in terms of offering incentives such as free parking for people with electric vehicles, or perhaps an assurance that the money raised in this will go into cycling infrastructure imp improvement directly. You know, if you're serious about saying that, then can you give that guarantee that the 140,000 or so raise a year from this will go directly into those cycling infrastructure improvements. I think it's also worth, you know, it's easy to get into a kind of bash the motorists and make assumptions that motorists can all afford it or they're all kind of wealthy people and they just need to choose the cycle. It's also worth remembering that a lot of people who drive do so perhaps because they've got mobility issues and cycling and walking long distances for journeys isn't an option for everyone. Uh, it often has is as well kind of uh, working class people who have to physically travel for a job. Some of us will be lucky enough to be able to work from home and not necessarily go to an office. Or if you're commuting, then you're commuting perhaps to Leeds or Manchester. But if you are if you have to work locally in manual trade, and you've got no choice but to drive a van or a car. So I think we, we have to just be wary of that, that actually a lot of the people who are driving uh, are not always the kind of wealthy people who can uh, afford to do it. And they have to have a car through the necessity of their employment. Public transport, you know, great if it exists, but um, unfortunately, if you live on the top, so in lots of places in Coldwell, there's Apache public transport service. Um, a lot of the buses are diesel polluting buses and not that much greener than, say, an electric car. 
Uh, and as we know at the moment, you know, the numbers of people on buses are going to be severely restricted. So it's going to be even more difficult. And some of the government advice is actually saying avoid public transport and drive by car. So, um, you know, except you have to review parking charges from time to time again. But perhaps I'd rather see just a small increase across the board rather than introducing new charges in certain areas in the evening. Thank you. Um, so I've got um, Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Scullion, and then and I'll get Councillor Press to come come back out of the order. Um, may, may, have been the, may have been the other way around, which order did I say? Um, Councillor Wilkinson, you can come first. Thank you. I um, appreciate what Councillor Baker's uh, said. It is an issue that people do get, get passionate about, but people are never in favour of parking charge increases as it's never seen to be a good time to be increasing them but I think sometimes as a cabinet you've got to make dis difficult decisions when they're the right decisions and we have declared a climate emergency as a council and that means all of us making some big changes to how we do things. My own ward Sobby Bridge has a horrendous traffic congestion problem has done for many many years really poor air quality been an air quality management area for probably about 15 years. I think if we're going to get serious about things like climate change and air pollution, then we need to bring in these sorts of measures that might start to make people think about making different choices. I just finally say as well that we, I think Councillor Patient alluded to the highways peer review that we had. And from what I understand, they were actually quite amazed really at how low our parking charges are. And I think that's partly because it, this has been put off for so long um, and I think having no overall control on the council has been part of the reason for that because you know cabinets in the past have been scared to do it because we saw what happened in 2014 um, but I think now that we do have um, you know overall control as a Labour uh, a Labour council I think we have to be bold and be seen to be doing the right thing even if it's a, a difficult decision to make so I'll be I'll be supporting this. Uh, Councillor Scullion. Thank you. I wonder if I could respond to the points that both Councillor Lee and Councillor Baker made. Um, Councillor Lee is absolutely right that the high street is in difficulty, and indeed it was in difficulty before the pandemic. Let's face it, our high street was in real trouble. We saw some of the big anchor chains uh, disappearing. We were perhaps less affected than other towns because we had more individual individual shops. But retail is in high streets across the country has been in trouble. And that's partly because of the internet. We simply cannot ignore the phenomenon of internet shopping. And the pandemic has accelerated that. And that means that we need to think, and we do think, Councillor Lee, about the needs, the needs of retail in terms of thinking about how we might use our streets better, how we might let people spill out into streets in a safe way in terms of restaurants and bars uh, to encourage safe distancing, because we don't think the pandemic is, we're told that the pandemic is likely to, to, to recur at different times. So thinking very carefully about the experience of retail and how we're going to support those small businesses. We've got some fantastic small businesses and retail offers in Calderdale. So we are thinking about that, but it's not just the pandemic and it's not just parking that are causing a crisis in our high street and our retail businesses. But you're absolutely right. This needs to be high on our agenda. Um, Councillor Baker, I am slightly disappointed that um, some of those green credentials seem to be worn rather lightly in the face of this issue. And let me remind, cabinet members and others who might be watching or listening that actually car parking revenue cannot be used for income um, in, in general income it is used for transport and highways highways issues it's dedicated to that and we spend more of course um, uh, than we get from government and um, car parking income and indeed keeping up the highways in Calderdale is an enormous enormous uh, challenge um, and my question back really in some ways to all of us is, if not now, when? We have declared a climate emergency. Is this a meaningless statement which doesn't change any of 
the decisions that we make. Um, we are very conscious that people use parking in different ways in this borough. You have shop workers who use short term free spaces all day clogging up um, the shoppers, indeed the people with mobility difficulties who want to come in and, and park for a short time um, have turnover near, near the shops. Um, I think there's a more important thing that comes back to me in terms of the point about, let's face it, um, proportionally um, moderate and modest increases given some of the other things that we are dealing with in life at the moment. Actually, as far as people said, absolutely crucial here is air quality. It's actually keeping children and people with respiratory diseases safe. Um, look at the pandemic, which has improved our air quality tremendously. And we're going through a very difficult time in many ways in relation to transport. Um, and we really need to basically take this opportunity. So I, I repeat what I said earlier, if not now, when? we have actually got the backs of our towns and villages and we'll do our best really to help them develop, develop and grow. But just giving cheap or free parking everywhere is not the answer to making our towns and village centres grow. Sorry. Thanks, uh, thanks Jane. Um, Councillor Press, who wants to come back? And I'll put this on. Yes, uh, there were just a couple of things. Others um, have said, uh, or commented on things that I, I would have done. Um, but I wanted to go back to the comment, I think that Councillor Patience and Councillor Wilkinson made about the peer review. I was also uh, at a meeting um, with our uh, counterparts from Walton Forest and other places, and they actually couldn't believe um, how, they were, they were staggered actually at, the, at what we were charging for parking. So, but that, that's already been said. Um, I do find it, um, I find it a little bit odd that anyone would suggest that people going out for an, an evening meal in Halifax, well, let's be honest, these days you're very lucky if you come away with change from uh, £40 for a meal for two, um, and that's probably being modest, um, would, that would be deterred by, you know, an extra, uh, extra pennies uh, on on, on to, to have to pay an extra 40p or 50p for, for parking their car. So I, I, do, I do think that is really not the case. Also, um, people use, using public transports, um, they have to pay increases year on year, every year. Um, and if you were to look um, comparatively at the costs that um, people who don't have access to cars uh, and don't have any choice pay, um, in, and compare park, car parking with that, then, then obviously um, there's a huge disparity really um, between that um, and between bus and rail fares. So um, I'm also concerned about, very concerned uh, about our working class communities, but our working class communities and the most, perhaps the, the least well off pay far more in terms of public transport than, than do people who use cars. So I kind of think that, you know, what we're actually talking about here is Councillor Scullion said, if not now, when we were supposed to be doing some of this 2006, some we were about to do, but we withdrew it in 2014, it's now 2020, and we just cannot go on um, as we have been doing. Um, so I, uh, I would again uh, put these recommendations to Cabinet. Thank you, Councillor Press. Um, I won't have the other comment. I, I have a feeling this might be an issue we discuss again. Um, um, on, on more than one occasion. I would just urge people, I think rather than um, just um, yes yes or no, are you in favour of this or not, to, you know, to have a proper look at the draft outline parking strategy, because I do think really the important issue is going forward is to think about how parking is used to deliver on, on different objectives. And I think, um, you know, on-street parking in particular is going to become scarcer if we, if for a, if for a considerable period of time, we need to, um, you know, provide more space for social distancing. I think one of the things the crisis has told us is how much of our road space is occupied by parked cars, and how much is given over to cars generally, and how little to other other people. And and inevitably, we're going to have to look at that again, and we're going to have to think about how we make towns work in a context where 
you know, parking straight outside the shop is perhaps not the thing that people are, are always, always able to do. Um, but it also seems to me that in terms of rethinking the future of town centres, actually also the idea of people dashing into town, popping out of their car into one shop and out again. Again, I'd ask if that's really what, what we see as building for a sustainable town equally, that towns need to be places where people spend time and do a range of activities. However, that's probably part of a wider debate than this paper. So um, and Council Press has moved and Council Patients seconded the recommendations. So can I see all those in favour, please? Thank you. Um, let me find my agenda. Item nine, um, charging infrastructure deployment. Councillor Patient, maybe a short Thank item. you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I guess this um, just highlights the issue of how various papers that do come forward here aren't trying to, um, aren't trying to crack an issue in, in isolation. Um, a lot of the work that we're doing is in tandem with other bits in terms of our um, um, ambition to be um, uh, carbon neutral by 2038 and all the various landmarks along the way. So uh, this is a timely report and uh, a lot of hard work's gone into it, especially from members of our environmental projects team and um, other people from within CAFAM and uh, environmental quality and compliance. So um, what this does essentially is um, it asks for approval to add um, some really definitely much needed um, charging infrastructure to the um, purchase of the 36 vehicles that we will be getting for the council uh, to provide uh, various services all across the board, including um, the mayor's new car, um, which um, I believe is a um, Toyota Ionic or, or similar. Um, but what this will allow us to do is um, to cut emissions from 75% per vehicle, um, and hopefully um, fill the rest of that 25% up um, along the way as grid, grid decarbonisation happens. Um, so there are obvious air quality benefits um, to this as well. Um, it definitely ticks all of our climate emergency ambitions and our sustainable towns, etc. while we're thinking about air quality and um, COVID in the same context. Um, so how this will be done is through the capital program um, and the cost will be split um, amongst four different directorates. Um, so the old inefficient vehicles that we're using were sort of uh, delivering all those key services. So what we've been mindful to do is um, take guidance from the DFT uh, and from the Energy Saving Trust in terms of where these vehicles will be best deployed. Um, so they're all across the service from waste management um, to um, social care and like I mentioned before the mayor's the mayor's vehicle um, it'll give a saving of uh, 50k per annum per annum um, so it'll wash its face quite quickly but um, it isn't just the financial costs it's the benefits that I outlined earlier um, so we've all been enjoying that um, extra air quality benefits that have happened recently and I think this is part of the puzzle to allow us to continue doing that um, I don't know. I don't want to go through the um, paper piece by piece. I'm sure you've had a look at it. Um, I'm definitely open to questions, but I'm basically asking the cabinet for approval um, to okay the associated costs with this. Um, but yeah, it's a timely piece. Thank you, Scott. Um, had any indications on this one? This is fairly straightforward and sensible. So. Um, in that case, my second the recommendations. Can I see all those in favour? That's agreed. Thank you. Um, item 10, West Yorkshire Plus Transport Fund, Land Acquisition, CPO, etc. Uh, Councillor Scullion. Thank you, Leader. Um, this is a report about some very, very small slivers of land. Um, and asking uh, for permission to use a compulsory purchase order on those pieces of land um, for two reasons. Um, one is that um, in some cases the land, the ownership is unknown and compulsory purchase order is in fact the only legal way of acquiring those particular slivers of land and that's outlined in the report at 7.6. Um, I won't go into detail, the maps are there. Um, the funding comes from the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, and that's outlined at um, 
uh, section 6.4 of the report. Um, so I ask members, unless there are any questions, uh, to give approval um, to agree the recommendations that are outlined in 3.1, 3.2, 3.3 and 3.4. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Any questions or comments on these the schemes have been here before, so there's a minor change to the detail. Okay, in that case, can I see are we all in favour? That's agreed. Thank you. Um, item 11, final accounts, revenue outturns, is you again, Councillor Scullion. Thank you, Leader. This is the point in the year when we bring the revenue um, outturn position. And I wanted to say just a few words of uh, introduction um, about this um, just at this point in the year and a few caveats about going, going forward. Um, and then I'll come on to the, the four recommendations as uh, section three. The report covers last year, the last financial year, municipal year, which is 2019-2020, and it shows our position at 31st March this year. And it summarizes how each of the directorates have managed the service delivery within their budgets um, and the reasons for any major variances. It also, in this report, it shows you the levels of balances and reserves used during the year, and I'll come back to that, and that are able to carry forward or not into to future years. And you will remember the previous revenue outturn reports which I brought to this cabinet in terms of the particular difficulty of managing the budget in year. And at year end, uh, directorates overspent, as I was flagging up throughout the year, by nearly 4.2 million pounds. And that is actually, I know it doesn't sound like it, but it is actually improvement of 600,000 uh, compared to the previous monitor, which was reported to you, and that is the in-year actions taken by directors. And indeed, um, somebody earlier in the meeting, one of the other cabinet members mentioned the um, the challenge challenge meetings that we've been having, and working away at each of those to bring those budgets uh, back into line. The majority of overspends, of course, were in children's and adults social care, where we've been reporting increased demand increased complexity of care and increased costs in terms of the market of what it costs for us to provide some very specialist care for some very vulnerable individuals who are in the care of, of the local authority. And we're not alone in that, it's a national picture of those authorities that have got responsibility for social services for children, adults. We have of course tried within the year to meet director overspendings with underspends on corporate budgets and additional funding that we brought in. And we've also brought in um, just over 1.3 million to balance that figure coming from the minimum reserve provision in line with the cabinet's agreed um, strategy in relation to that. But the picture, I said I'd come back to the question of balances and reserves. Excluding those set aside for schools, which is separate, the council's reserves have reduced by just 375,000 this last year to 30.2 million. However, it does hide the true scale of the reserves that we did use to support the budget during 1920. Some councils nationally have taken a borrowing your way out of a, a financial challenge. We have not, we have used our reserves and I think we have used our reserves carefully and wisely but it's not a position that continue, can continue. Um, and the year end figure just in the year end, if you think the year end was 31st of March, there is a small amount of COVID related government funding in that, that year end figure, which I think perhaps um, distorts what otherwise would have, been, would have been the amount. There was 5.8 million pounds of government, uh, of government COVID funding um, and that will actually need to be spent over the coming year to defray the cost that we are currently incurring. Um, balances have also decreased during the year and now stand at 5.5 million. You remember previously saying that um, we were not prepared. I don't think our auditors would be very thrilled to let our, our um, 
balances or reserves in that sense, uncommitted reserves to fall below 5 million, but the, currently they're at 5.5 million. And um, the head of finance has reminded me that um, uh, there is a need for more sustainable budgets in the future. We cannot deplete those reserves any further. We are very stretched in terms of income and we were even before the, um, the pandemic. So there is a great deal really to challenge any portfolio holder and any head of finance in terms of facing the financial challenges that we face at the moment. It's therefore crucial and the key message here um, for yourselves as cabinet members and for the for wider staff cohort of managers, particularly, we have to deliver the agreed savings that were agreed for 2021. And we have to basically ensure that that challenge is absolutely rigorous. There is no more wriggle room in relation to that budget. However, I also have to add a caveat, which is that all of these plans are being reworked and reviewed as we speak, because of course, this is last year's revenue outturn. We have got a medium term financial strategy, which of course will be reviewed. And we of course have, um, we are forecasting income shortfalls um, for the council. And there are a number of things we have to do in order to try our best to mitigate the impact of that. Um, Clearly, the way in which the council, are, the council, the government are responding to the pandemic has enormous impact on ourselves as a council and other councils. Um, we are lobbying through the local government association and SIGOMA, um, the interest groups of metropolitan authorities, um, to basically say this is a situation that the central government do need to address, particularly the problems in relation to older people's social care, adult social care, and children's social care, that we cannot carry on with the increasing level of demand, the increasing costs, and less money flowing into the local government um, financial coffers. Um, this report will, of course, go to the Audit Committee later in the year. And I want to now refer you to the recommendations, which are at 3.1 to 3.4 in the report. Cabinet are asked to note the summary analysis that's contained within the report, the impact on balances and reserves, and I'm happy to take any questions on that, and indeed the underlying budget pressures. But as I say, we are re reworking these given the COVID-19 situation. 3.2 agrees to retaining balances above the minimum level um, in order to give us what flexibility we can. Um, agrees to the use of 231,000 from the additional funding from government for the financial implication of the coronavirus to be used to meet the losses of income in sports and parking, very topical, and additional ICT costs in enabling homework. I think we've done a fantastic job in getting about 1,300 uh, council workers set up in terms of homeworking. And um, I think our IT department have played a blinder. Um, and finally, 3.4, that the report be presented to the, the scrutiny board, the strategy and performance scrutiny board. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. Um, that's pretty thorough. Are there any questions or comments on, uh, on this report? Um, no, I'm not seeing. Not seeing any 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 at the moment. I think you've probably answered most people's questions on that one. Um, on that one, Councillor Scullion. Um, obviously, it is quite a challenging position, but also also a complex one now with with the many unknowns about the position going forward. But hopefully, this gives people some clarity about the um, the underlying pressures that were that were there beforehand. Um, whether coming out of this we will we will finally see some fresh thinking about how social care should be paid for um, I'm not sure it's it's certainly an issue that um, has has a very high salience I think many people in health have particularly recognized that some of the challenges they face in dealing with covid are are the results of those underlying pressures in social care and are very supportive of uh, 
moves to put pressure on to try and get solutions, but uh, there's, there's a long way to go with that. Jane, do you want to come back? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I do realise that um, it's not specifically referenced in the report, but in terms of looking forward, just for the sake of completeness, it is worth saying that the government are minded to grant a devolution deal to the West Yorkshire councils. And one of the known unknowns at the moment is what the actual consequences of that might be financially um, for Calderdale Council. So I'm sure we'll be dealing with this at future meetings, but I just wanted to say that's another part of the picture going forward in terms of managing our financial responsibilities. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, so I've changed with the recommendations, which are second. Can I see all those in favour? Thank you. So that, um, that concludes the public part of the meeting. We have one um, item to take below the line. So, um, and Kirsty, can I ask you to confirm when the live streaming's been